Kids Life Church. We are so glad you're here to continue to grow with us today. First, we're going to have some important announcements. Then we're going to have some awesome worship music. And then Pastor Jonathan's going to bring us a great message. Please put your change in the jar. It helps support our youth. Don't forget to check out our board. It has all the information you need to know. Please place your ties in the envelopes and put them in the bucket on the back table. If you have any offerings, you can mark them on the envelope. Tonight, Mark Palmer's class resumes. It's called Let's Possess the Land, and we'll be going over the first two chapters of Joshua. If you've tithed in 2020, please see Linda for your tax statement. Women's Craft Day is on January 24th, following service. And we have a potluck lunch following service on January 31st. Now let's get ready for some awesome worship music. Several weeks ago, we, I started a three-week series, and it's been pretty awesome, like how all of this unfolds, because, you know, I've just come to the, to the conclusion in my life that, that I just got to let, let things roll, and if I can't do something one week, then, well, we'll just get to it the next week. And it's been awesome how things have kind of lined up with, with stuff that's going on in the church and, and in the world. And so, you know, I, I did the first one was the church government. The second one that I did was family government, and wouldn't you know it, after we've had, you know, a terrible event take place in the United States concerning government, right, we, I'm going to be talking about civil government today, and so I, I really feel like it's perfect timing in this situation. Um, what you're going to see, though, is that, and I've constantly made sure that I repeat this, that in God's economy or God's government, um, he really mirrors everything. If you look at the church, it's just a bigger form of the home, right? And if you look at God's government, it's really just a bigger form of the church. And so there's not really a lot uh, that I have to go into um, concerning this, and you'll see it. I'm just going to kind of more than anything tell you the history of how it began, um, but uh, I have more to say after that concerning the, the situation that our nation is in right now. Um, but Thomas Aquinas was a 13th century Italian philosopher. And he was a leader of the church back then. And he said that there are three types of biblical precepts. He said, one, there's moral. Two, there's ceremonial. And three, there is judicial. He said that moral laws are permanent having held even before the law was given, since they are a part of the law of nature. And so basically what he's saying is, is that the morals that we find in Scripture, they've basically existed forever. They didn't have to be written down on a piece of paper for us to know that they were right, because these morals come out of God's character. There's a, uh, a dilemma they call that took place in... Oh, I, I can't even remember the year, probably somewhere around the time that Thomas Aquinas lived, um, probably the 13th century. And uh, this dilemma said, is something good because God wills it, or is something already good, so therefore God wills it? I'll say that again. Is something good because God wills it? Or is something already good, and so therefore God wills it? It's a little bit of a dilemma, right? That for a long time, people thought about that, and they thought, but when you look at it both directions, from either side, it, it's not right. Because if, if something's good because God wills it, well, then what if he willed that beating your children were good? It was good. Does that mean it's good? So it can't be that. And then we look at the other side, that something is good, so therefore God wills it. Well, that doesn't make sense either, because then there's a standard that's higher than God, and he has to look up to that standard and say, see, the answer to it is, is that we have to recognize who God is. He is the good. And so everything that flows forth from God is the good, right? And that's how that was... was uh, uh, taken care of. And so the same thing goes with the laws that we see in Scripture, right? All of the laws that are put forth in Scripture came from the very being of God. 
of who he is, right? So, I think one of the, the biggest problems that we're having today is that humanity typically follows the moral standards of its country, right? If the government says it's okay, it must be, right? If, if the law says that this is okay, then it must be okay. But what we have to understand is that uh, that's not true. We saw the riots that took place in the capital. And uh, I don't know if you guys realize this or not. I know that there's a lot of people that have condemned what took place. But that is actually a legal action according to our Declaration of Independence. In the minds of those people, we have a tyrannical government right now that's trying to do everything they can to cheat, to lie, in order to get a place in the government. And so according to the Declaration of Independence, if we have a, or, or a, a tyrannical government, it's the right of the people to rise up and try to take it back. But this is the thing, that's not biblical. It's not biblical. I know probably over the course of the last... Uh, uh, I don't know, four years? Well, I guess I haven't really been preaching that long. Three years? Three and a half years? A lot of you that are Democrats or left, left-handed left people probably feel like that I've been hammering you guys. But today, it's going to be the other side that gets hammered because you'll find out that I don't support a party. I support Jesus Christ. I do believe, I have my own opinion, that there is a side that's protecting, trying to protect the church, and one that's trying to attack it, but that doesn't mean there's good, there's not good on both sides and not bad on both sides. And one of the things that I, that I noticed though too, and this is something I needed to point out before I move forward, is that there's been people on Facebook that I've seen that, are, that have really jumped out to attack what took place in the Capitol, but they were silent over what happened with Antifa and Black Lives Matter. That's hypocrisy. Because if one is wrong, they're both wrong. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. This is not God's government. So we're going to take a look at how God set up his government. Okay? God's government for his nation began with Moses, right? So we have Moses, and he's fled into the, to the wilderness, and he's lived for 40 years in the wilderness, and uh, he's walking through the desert, and all of a sudden he sees this burning bush, and he thinks, well, that's kind of strange. Now, I, I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but in the desert where he's from, it was actually common for a bush just to ignite in flames. That was a common thing, right? So it wasn't that the bush was burning that got his attention. What got his attention was that it wasn't being consumed. It just continued to burn. And so Moses begins to walk up to it, and he, he, he walks up, and you know, God says, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. And so he takes them off, and he says, look, he said, I've heard the cry of my people. I've seen the pain and suffering of them, and I want you to lead them out. That right there was the first step. It's at Exodus 3.10. It says, Therefore come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. Right? So that is the first step in government that we see in the Bible. We have a leader. So Moses leads the people out of Egypt. Then he sets up judges. I'm sorry, he sets and judges. From day and night, Scripture says. Well, actually, it says from morning until evening is the words that in my translation. From morning to evening, every day. He's sitting here judging the people. Now, if you look at Scripture, you may not even know this, but according to what uh, the Bible says, there were 600,000, a little more than 600,000. I just took an easy number. 600,000, easy one to remember. 600,000 men and then their wives that came out of Egypt, right? So we have at least 600,000 men. And during this period of time, a lot of men, and it's, it wasn't something, well, we're not going to get into that. A lot of men had more than one wife, right? So it could be that there may have been three times the amount of women. And then you've got to add your children. But I figured that we would go off, a, again, an easy number to remember. We can say that there could possibly have been somewhere in the neighborhood of two million people that came out of Egypt with Moses leading them. And here he is, now he's out in the desert, and let's be honest, 
We can get two people together in a room, and eventually they're going to argue. I mean, is marriage not an example of that? <laughs> right? <laughs> so here's two million and they're coming to Moses, and they're, say, they're saying, you know, this took place, this happened, and could, could you help us uh, with this? And so from morning until evening, this is all he's doing. Can you imagine how worn out he would be? I looked uh, uh, online, and uh, I found out that if you took the city of Phoenix, Arizona, which is the fifth largest city in the United States, and the city of Tulsa, and you combine them together, that equals about two million people, right? Right? So that's the size of community that J Moses was judging by himself. And so I did a little bit more research and I found out that the city of Phoenix, Arizona has 45 municipal judges. A mun municipal judge means a city judge. 45 of them, right? There's 25 that are full-time and 20 others that are on standby to help and fill in when the other ones can't get to certain cases, right? So here's Moses doing the job of 45 people. Then some wisdom comes into his life. Exodus 18, starting in verse 13, says, It came about the next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood about Moses from the morning until the evening. Now when Moses' father-in-law <clears throat> saw all that he was doing from the people, he said, What is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge, and all the people stand before, about you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, it comes to me, and I judge between a man and his neighbor and make known the statutes of God and, and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing that you are doing is not good. You will surely wear out both yourself and these people who are with you, for the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. I will give you counsel, and God be with you. You be the people's representative before God, and you bring the disputes to God. Then teach them the statutes of the laws, and make known to them the way in which they are to walk and, <clears throat> and the work they are to do. Furthermore, you shall select out of all the people able men who fear God, men of truth, those who hate dishonest gain, and you shall place these over them as leaders of thousands, of leaders of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. Let them judge the people at all times, and let it be the very major dispute, every major dispute they will bring to you, but every minor dispute they themselves will judge. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all these people also will go to their place in peace. So Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Now see, if you look at that, now we're seeing the church. You've got the single guy that sits at the top, and he's, he's hearing from God, it's his job to hear from God. Not that anybody else, everybody else can hear from God too, but it's his job to hear for the church, or, you know, concerning the church. It's his job to hear from the Lord concerning the nation of Israel. And then he has all the people that are surrounding him to help, right? And so, honestly, like I said, after we've talked about the home and how that works, and we've talked about the church and how that works, it really just falls into place when you look at the government. It's the same way. They, they, it's supposed to be set up exactly the same. This is what's very important here that we have to understand too. And this applies to the church and it also applies to the home. Moses was judging the Israelites based upon what he thought was right and wrong. The best way he knew how. He never had time to even go hear from God. Because it wasn't until three chapters later that he goes up on the mountain and he receives the commandments, the law. You see, if we have pastors that are doing so much, they're doing everything, how are they ever supposed to hear from God? They can't. Because they're always busy doing something else. When we have fathers that are doing everything in the home, and they don't have any help, how are they supposed to hear from God concerning the, the direction of their family? The same thing goes for our government. If we, if we had, we, what we have to understand is we do not have a godly government in this nation. It's plain and simple, okay? Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that more in a minute. But having said that, it's supposed to be the same way for the government. There should be a man who is directed and led by God. 
And that man has people around him that support him and help him in those things. Nowadays, we don't have that at all. Not even close. God's government for his people was set up based upon his law. And uh, what we have to understand is that we are now his people. And so we can do all the screaming and hollering we want about government. We can be happy about a new president. We can be sad about losing the old president. But none of that means anything because we're under a different government. Plain and simple. That is not our government. We have a, a godly, heavenly government that rules us. Okay, so this is where things, that, that's kind of the end of talking about uh, how the government should be set up as far as, as, as civil government goes. And I want to kind of look at um, the way things are here in our nation now. And I want to try and point out some things that people may think are Christian things, but they're not. Um, from this point, Moses passes the job on to Joshua, okay? Now, Joshua, and it's, it's funny how things work out because uh, tonight um, we're actually going to be going through the book of Joshua, starting with Mark at 6 o'clock, and it's going to be the conquest of, of taking, uh, what was it called? That's true, I forgot the name of it now. Yeah, possessing the land. And, you know, just like God had, had ordained the Israelites to go in and possess that land, there are things in our lives that he's ordained for us to go in and possess. And uh, so I'm pretty excited about that. But anyways, we're, here's Joshua now. Joshua has been given Moses' job, right? He is now the leader, okay? And he goes in, he takes back all of these nations, or all of the land that God had promised to them. And then at that point... Something seems to happen because it says that each person went to their own land and it says that all the people followed God all the days of Joshua's life and the days of the lives of the elders that saw the miracles of God and the things that he did. But when they died, they no longer followed him anymore and they turned to the balls and they turned to the Ashtaroth and they begin to worship other gods. And so I, I actually, I called several people and I was trying to figure out what exactly is going on here where there is no longer any government. Because when you go through the whole entire book of Judges, there's a period of time where there's really just one man that will rise up and God will use him to be able to judge people and then they will start to, to turn right again and then they die and it's right back to the same old thing once again. And the best thing that I could come up with and this is not just me, but also a few people just conversating together is this, is that Joshua did not do what Moses did. Moses raised Joshua up to be a leader to take his place. But Joshua didn't raise anyone up. When Joshua was gone, it was done. There were no more leaders to take the place. Whenever his elders that surrounded him died, it was basically over. He, no one got raised up to take the, take the duty again. And so I really, when I'm thinking about this, I think about how that's kind of how it's operating right now in the United States. You know, we have a, a nation right now that everyone knows is going down the wrong path. We all know that there's something wrong. Now, we disagree on what needs to be done sometimes, but we know there's a problem and things need to change, right? And everybody knows this. You want to know what the problem is? It's because there was a whole generation of, of parents that stopped taking their kids to church. They were raised up in church. They went to church every week. But then when they got out of church, they, they knew God, they knew Jesus, but they just didn't feel it was quite that important to go to church anymore. And so now we have a whole generation called millennials that really haven't been to church. They don't have any desire to go to church. And we're having the same problems that they were having in Israel. Israel. As we begin to fall away from God. And so what would happen though, and this is what we got to realize guys. Every time this would take place, the people would fall into servitude. They would become slaves. You know, they would, 
you know, be destitute. They wouldn't have any money. They'd be broke. Um, they would feel, you know, other countries would come in and rob and steal from them. And through persecution, then they would get on their knees and cry out to God and say, Lord. And so all of the praying that we've done as a church, Lord God, I mean, maybe I, I'm the only one, but Lord God, please, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would return to this nation. I pray that you would change people's hearts. I pray that you would open their eyes. I'm screaming this. And the answer to that may be what we're dealing with right now. That may be the answer to our prayers. Because when we see violence and we see destruction, we want to, God, what's going on? And he says, ah, that's where I've wanted you the whole time. But whenever things are comfortable and soft and easy, we don't seek God. You see, it was at this point, whenever there was no one raised up in Israel, that sin entered in. They stopped following God's ways. And the government that they had put in place fell to pieces. You know, one of the things that I saw, and obviously I, I, you shared, you know, this guy that, that sang the prayer for Congress, and he ends it in a man and a woman. Now, first of all, that's just ignorance, okay? I, and it's not, I'm not saying anything bad about him when I say ignorance, because ignorance just means not knowing. The word amen has nothing to do with gender. It, all amen means is uh, let it be so, Right? And so it's just that here's this guy that's supposed to be this pastor, and he has no idea that amen has nothing to do with gender, right? But I'm going to tell you what's worse. That was silly, but that's not what was bad in this situation. Did you guys hear the name of the God that he said he prayed in the name of? If you go online and you, read, or you listen, he prays in the name of the God Brahma, which is a Hindu God. You see, that's the direction that we're going right now. You see, that's exactly what happened in Israel. When we stop teaching our children about the Lord, now they'll follow any God. And so now we have a man that's in Congress that's been voted in by the people, and he's praying to the God Brahma, just like in Israel. You see, in Israel, the people realized that something was wrong. They realized that, that wait a minute, we, we don't have a government the way that, 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 that we need. You know, things are not organized in this nation. We've got trouble, we've got problems, right? Just like what we're saying here. That's what they do. They say, God, or well, they say, we need to fix this. How many of us think that we need to fix this in the United States? Right? Raise your hand. There's, if, you, if you believe. Right? Most exactly. Two hands. There's something wrong here. This is what the people of Israel do. At this point, we're at the, the last judge. And he's a godly man named Samuel. And he did the best he could to set up elders and, and form a government. But there just wasn't anyone that was following Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 to 22 said, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us, judge us like all the nations. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they have said to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. You see, guys, God wants to be king. God wants to be president. Like all the deeds which they have done since the day they brought them up from Egypt, even to this day, in that they have forsaken me and served other gods, Praying to Brahma. So they are doing to you also. Now then, 
Listen to their voice. However, you shall solemnly warn them and tell them of the procedures of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel spoke all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him of a king. This will be the procedure of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and place them for himself in his chariots and among his horsemen, and they will run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and of fifties, and some to do his plowing and to reap his harvest and to make his weapons of war and equip for his chariots. He will also take your daughters for perfumes and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will also take your male and female servants and or male servants and your female servants and your best young men and your donkeys and use them for his work. He will take a tenth of your flock. You realize that's taxes, right? He will take a tenth of your flocks and you will yourself will become his servants. Then you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us. That we also may be like the nations. Want to be like the world. That our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Now after Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the Lord's hearing. The Lord said to Samuel, listen to their voice and appoint them a king. So Samuel said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. You see? Instead of turning to God, they turned to a man. And I, I'm telling you right now, that is exactly what both parties have been doing. We think that the Republican Party believe that Trump's the guy that's going to just deliver us out of this thing, and he's going to change stuff, and it's going to be great. And then you've got the, the Democrats that say, oh, you know, we got to get Trump out of there because we need to get this next man in and he's going to be awesome and he's going to take us and he's going to give us change and things are going to go well. We're turning towards men. Just like Israel did. And it is only God that can fix the problem. And that's it. Nobody else. You see, this is where I get the idea that God never intended the idea of separation of church and state. God wants to be the state. Just like he is the good, he wants to also be the state. And every moral law, every civil law, everything needs to roll forth from him. And that governs us. I'm going to read the, the First Amendment of the Constitution here. And this is probably where, you know, honestly, to tell you the truth, you know, our YouTube channel hadn't really got as much views and things like that as I'd hoped it would. Um, I know we only have 44 subscribers right now to begin with, but uh, this is the point where if there are people out there that, that do watch it, um, where they come across this, this is where they start to stone me. Um, and I think possibly even people in the church here today, I don't know, maybe you will disagree as well. But I promise you all I'm doing is giving you scripture. The First Amendment of the Constitution says, Congress shall make no law res respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the, th the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievance. You see, let me start. I'm going to break this down just a little bit. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion. That's not godly. God said he didn't want any other gods before him. Or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's not too bad. That kind of works in our favor. Because that gives me the ability to say what I'm saying right now. That time may be taken away sometime soon. And I've honestly been praying that 
my YouTube channel doesn't get too popular because I can tell you right now, if some people in the government saw me preaching what I preach, they probably, you guys would be visiting me in jail, most likely. <laughs> or abridging the freedom of speech. See, that, that gives, that's a good one. That gives me the right to say what I have to say. But that's still really not biblical. Because God tells us that we need to be kind. Doesn't he? Having the freedom of speech, that doesn't mean that I can blast someone. Or of the press. Or the right of the people to peacefully assemble. I'm about to show you that that is absolutely not biblical. The right of the people to peaceably assemble. We, our Constitution gives us that right, but not God. God doesn't. You see, what's happened is, here in the United States, is that we've had all of these freedoms that have been given to us, and we, we, we always hear people say, oh, the, 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 the foundation of our nation was Christianity. And to a large degree, that's true. But did you guys know that Thomas Jefferson was actually a deist? He, he, he believed there was a God, but he didn't know who he was. And in fact, if you go through and look at a lot of the people who wrote our, our documents, a lot of them weren't Christians. Now, are there Bible scriptures all over Washington, D.C.? Yeah, they are. There are. But when we look at these laws and these freedoms, we begin to realize, if we really honestly look at them, that they're not biblical. They're really not. You see, as us being the church today and being under the rule of Christ, this right here is what Paul has told us regarding peaceable assemblies. And what that means is the protest, the peaceful protest, right? Romans 13, 1 and 2. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. And there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Every single riot that we've seen in 2020 and 2021, all of those people, including yesterday, or, the, or with the Capitol, all of those people have brought condemnation onto their lives from beginning to end. It doesn't matter what label you have on yourself. You see, our, our government and God... We need to learn how to separate, separate those two things out. Our government's freedoms and what God says we're free to do. I'm going to give you, I know a lot of people, and I, I'm not saying whether this is true or isn't true. A lot of people are sitting there saying, but it was corrupt. You know, uh, it, that, that, that the election was rigged. You know, these are the things that people are screaming. Uh, that the, the media... And I know this is true. The media has swung to the, to the left and they don't say anything about the right that's good and they don't say anything about the left that's bad and so it's all just been preconditioned. That part I, I will say I agree with. I don't watch news anymore. It's nothing but lies. You can't, you can't believe anything they say. But this is the thing here. How many know the, the story of David and Saul? King David and Saul. And Saul was a terrible king. Even to the point that God removed his spirit from Saul. But yet, David had the opportunity to kill Saul. And his leader of his army, Abner, said, Kill him. God's given you into his hands. And he said, Far be it for me to do anything to the, to the, to the God's anointed. He recognized the authority that was in Saul as king. He had the ability to kill him. Instead, he just cuts a little piece off of his coat and then steps back and says, I got a little piece of your coat here. I could have hurt you, but I didn't. How about we just part ways? We have Paul standing for, before the high priest 
They've just murdered the Christ. And Paul says something to the high priest, and one of the high priest's followers, or, or men, whatever they call them, slaps him in the face. And Paul says, you, you say things to me about the law, and then you hit me. And he says, you know you can't talk like that to the high priest. At that po point, Paul's like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize who I was talking to. Because he recognized the authority, even though he was corrupt. Even though he killed Jesus. He recognized the authority. And the last one, Pontius Pilate. I've actually did a little bit of reading on Pontius Pilate. And uh, Pontius Pilate, see, when, whenever I was in, in Brownsville, we're right on the border down there. And Brownsville, you want to talk about a corrupt place. It is absolutely corrupt. While we were there, um, there were, I believe it was eight judges that were caught um, being a part of the cartels. And so there was a huge lawsuit that, went, uh, that took place. And, and we got to hear quite a bit about it, um, especially after it was over. Uh, couldn't hear much during the process because Paula's cousin was one of the lawyers that was involved in the case. And uh, one of them jumped off the causeway. It's a huge two-mile bridge that goes from the mainland of Texas out to the South Padre Island. And uh, one of them jumped off the bridge and committed suicide because he knew that there was no chance of him getting off and he didn't want to have to face, you know, his time in prison. But when, when, you're, when you're telling somebody, me, being a jail minister, and I'm going into this federal halfway house, and I'm sitting down with these guys, and I'm saying, you guys need to submit to authority, and they, man, do you know how corrupt people are around here? I ain't submitting to them. And so what I did was I began to do some research on Pontius Pilate. And there's a reason why I did that. I'll say it in just a second. Pontius Pilate was a tyrant to the Jewish people. In fact, there was even a time whenever he burned down one of the temples and uh, some of the Jewish priests died inside the temple. He was constantly harassing them in every way, taking statues and putting them inside the, the Jewish temples of, of the other gods and everything. Just he, he always always being har harassing him. And then on the day that Jesus was about to be crucified, he stood before Pontius Pilate. And he said, don't you have anything to say? He said, don't you realize I have the authority to let you go? And Jesus, out of his own mouth, says, there's no authority that's been given except from above. Pontius Pilate, his authority that he had was given from above. Corruption does not matter. I'm telling you right now, if Joe Biden is president, it's because God put him there. Plain and simple. You may not like it. You may love it. But I'm telling you right now, it's God's man for the hour. And whatever it is that's going to take place in this nation, God's in control. He's in control. We ain't got nothing to worry about. I mean, I don't want to go to prison. But I've been there before. It's okay. I know how it is. I can handle it. Right, Bootsy? <laughs> I, ain't, I ain't scared. I, I ain't scared. Yeah. I can do it. Just make sure you guys put some money on my books. You know, so I can get me a Pepsi every now and then. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, we have... We have been given two rights, I believe. The second one, you know, maybe you'll question. The first one, I, I have no doubt. But I believe we have really only been given two rights by God. And number one is to preach Scripture in truth, regardless of what other people say. That right there is a God-given right, and it supersedes anything a government has to say. We preach it in truth. The second thing I believe that is a God-given right is for us to protect our family. Those are things that God has given to us and he has ordained men to be provider and protector of their families. Having being a pastor, and if you've been here long enough, you know that there is, uh, I've, I've done a lot of teaching on how I believe that, uh, in fact, once we become a Christian, our brothers and sisters in Christ are actually more 
than what our fam- actual blood family is. When we look at Jesus, Jesus says, uh, you know, he's, he's in the synagogue and people come in and they say, your mother and your brothers are outside. And he said, who are my mothers and brothers but those who do the will of God? And so he was saying that when we come into the Christian family, we're actually stronger than what blood is. And so having said that, I believe without a doubt that it is our duty to protect each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. I believe those are the only two things that we have the right to do. Everything else, we sit at home and we get on our knees. We don't storm capitals. You know, we don't burn down cities. We don't do any of that stuff because that's not our God-given right. And we live under a different government than the rest of the world does. You think I'll get stoned for that one? Because I can tell you right now, there's a lot of people out there that will disagree. Let's pray. Father God, I just come before you now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I just pray peace, Father, in every heart here this morning. Lord, as we see the the leaders of this nation praying in the name of foreign gods. Father, we know that there is going to be difficult times ahead. Father, I pray that you would just help us to see that regardless of the situation, that you've got the matter in the palm of your hand. Father, I pray that you would just give us the strength in the time of persecution To stand up in the name of Jesus. To not back down. But Father, to live a godly life before the people. Not attacking presidents. But praying for them. As God appointed leaders. Father God, I know that as we move forward in this time. Lord, I know that over the course of the last four years, we had half of the church that was just snarling, and they wouldn't even think about praying for the last president. Father, I pray you would bring conviction into their heart. And Father God, as we move forward with this new president... Lord, I ask right now in the name of Jesus that you would just put it in the other, the other side's heart to pray for this man. Father, ultimately you are the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we follow you. Help us to do it the way you've designed. Help us to be a church that follows your scripture and your plan so that the world can see something different in us. Father, we thank you. And we pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.